Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and look, it's Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. It's like she jumped out from behind a corner. I know, scared right? Scared me with her podcast wiles. How are <laughs> you? Feeling good? Happy yeah, February. Feeling great. Yes. Uh, as we record this, it is the first week of February, and uh, I don't know if you knew this, January is already over. One twelfth of the year is done. Nikki? Wow, one twelfth of the year. How was well it just I almost asked you how was it? Yeah, let's Ugh. not. Anyway, let's not do it's, that. <laughs> it's crazy that time yeah. is fa- passing as quickly as it is. And it, does. it is it goes also by fast. unnerving. It goes by so fast. And I think this whole conversation uh, that we are going to have today is apt, especially when we think about when I think about the nature of time passing. We are talking to Dr. Sharon Saline, a dear friend of the show uh, and a fantastic uh, A number one person about self-compassion and ADHD. And for me, this conversation is all about the language that I use with myself when I feel like I am not good enough, I am not capable enough to handle whatever is in front of me. And when time starts to feel like it's passing, it's real easy for that language to sneak in, right? To mm-hmm. for, for you to say to yourself, my goodness, uh, I, I can't get it done in time. I, it's just yet another way to reinforce language of shame. So, so Sharon is here and she is going to talk to us and give us some some tips to make positive reinforcement and, and that reinforcing behavior uh, a practice, a habit, a cause. I love it. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. Connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at TakeControlADHD. And uh, hey, you know, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. We have this way for you to support us, and it's called Patreon. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. It is listener supported podcasting. If you like what we're doing here, if you appreciate what we are doing with all of the stuff we're doing with the podcast, with all the episodes that we're doing, with the guests that we try to get on here to talk about important topics with your ADHD, uh, with the community, the Discord community that we have going on, if you appreciate all of that stuff, uh, we sure would appreciate you heading over to patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast and demonstrating that appreciation with a few dollars a month. You'll get access to super secret uh, uh, channels in Discord. You'll get access to the live stream of this podcast. You could join us and watch right along on video as we record these episodes with our guests. You also get access to extended editions. You get the raw live stream audio so you can get all the questions that we ask the guests after we finish the actual recording proper. It's it. Hey, it's a great deal. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. And now, shall we talk to Sharon? Do we have announcements? No, let's talk. No announcements? I want to talk to to Sharon. Sharon. All right, (laughs) Sharon. Dr. Sharon Celine specializes in an integrative approach to managing ADHD, anxiety, executive functioning skills, learning differences, and mental health in neurodiverse children, teens, adults, and families. And she joins us again today to talk all about living with ADHD and still managing to find a dose of self-compassion under the weight of it all. Sharon, friend, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Pete, friend, and Nikki, friend. Well, welcome. I'm so excited to have you, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time out to talk to us, especially about this uh, this this topic because it's so relevant in uh, everybody. But ADHD uh, folks, oh man, are they hard on themselves? So so hard. So let's talk about why, you know, compassion, self compassion, and even you know, I think self compassion. And it's be- and it's it's very close friend radical self radical radical acceptance. These two are very important for people with ADHD. And part of it is because um, 
from early on as a kid, you get messages about what you could do differently. Um, your name is called. You need to do this or stop doing that. Uh, you're aware that you know you can't follow conversations in the lunchroom or at at, in, at recess. You're overwhelmed or Maybe you think something's really funny and other kids don't. And so over time, what happens is that you develop a kind of vigilance, hypervigilance about yourself. Like, when is the next time that I'm going to do something that isn't uh, the right thing? And you can't see me all, but it's like my hands are doing the quote thing. Um, the, the right thing to do. What, when am I going to make a choice or engage in an activity and get you know, negative feedback or criticism or feel rejected. And so over time, um, we, we become critical of ourselves. We internalize that negative voice. It's, it, you know, in terms of uh, internal family systems theory, if any of you are part, you know, familiar with that, it's, a, it's that part of ourselves. And there are protector part of ourselves and there are other parts of ourselves. But in a way, uh, we use that negative self-talk uh, to sort of deflect before someone can do something or as a way to just say, you know, this just confirms that I really am not smart, that I'm really not attractive, and that basically, you know, uh, I'm, I stink, you know, kind of a thing, not smell, but you know, the other, mm -hmm. or I'm, I'm a mm -hmm. loser. Uh, I don't like to use that term, but that's what people say to themselves. And kids will mm -hmm. say to me, you know, it's because I suck. I'm like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we hear that. Mm -hmm. So we want to start to learn how to practice self-compassion and, and self-forgiveness to shift away from proving yourself, from judging yourself as less than, from seeing yourself as unworthy, to accepting yourself, that kind of radical self-acceptance, warts and all. Mm -hmm. Because to be able to laugh and to, to, ha to be able to see that we're going to stumble as part of living makes us human, right? And, mm -hmm. it, and it, it kind of levels the playing field. And I think a lot of people with ADHD feel like the playing field is not fair to start with and that they're at a disadvantage. The last time you were here, Sharon, we mentioned in part of the before chat or after chat that we were, you know, that, that self-compassion was important. And you said to us, oh, my goodness. I need to come back and talk to you about self-compassion. And then just this morning, Nikki said, my goodness, I have so many people I'm working with right now that need to hear this conversation about self-compassion. What is it for you both that you think is going on right now that makes, you know, the gestures broadly, the life and times we are living in, um, you know, a, something that people are facing or surfacing these issues of self-compassion more than, than, you know, say another the wear and tear of COVID for two years, we're now, you know, about to start year three, uh, has really um, worn people down. And it's beyond, uh, it's beyond COVID fatigue. It's, it's resilience fatigue. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, how many times can I reboot? Can I pull myself up? Can I pivot? Um, and for those of us who live in wintry areas, uh, it's it's even more difficult. I know here in the Northeast, we've had unusual and unusually cold January, temperatures at zero. Um, that is also a little bit disconcerting. You can't kind of go out. You can't, we can't really socialize in the way that those of us who are practicing COVID, particular COVID safeties are how we were before when we went outside. So I think there's isolation. I think there's discouragement. Um, and, and I think that um, there's, intense, there's in, intense and increased anxiety all around about life. And so this would then, um, for people who run on the anxious side, and a lot of people with ADHD do, um, they, that would mean that they also may run on the self-critical side. You know, I'm worried about an outcome that I'm uh, where uh, I, I'm not, I don't have certainty. And so if I don't have certainty, how um, that means that I could make a mistake and the result of making that mistake could be any different, any different level of humiliation or mm -hmm. regret or um, shame or belittlement. You know, it's just the list kind of goes on. I definitely agree, especially with uh, a client that I'm specifically thinking about. Uh, you know, 
when you are isolated and like you said, the weather right now is really, you can't go outside in some parts because it's so cold. Mm -hmm. And so this one particular client is, is in this small one bedroom apartment and, you know, she has to deal with, with some RSD factors um, from Mm -hmm. a job. And what I see and this is this is on top of mind just because I've been working with this particular person this week but it's um it's not only when is this going to happen there's just this assumption that mm-hmm. I am a bad person. I can't do this. Mm-hmm. I am never going to find the right job. Um, I am not made to be a project manager. I am not made to, you know, and, and so there's this automatic, just not even when it's just, this is who I am. And yeah. trying to break through that um, is really difficult. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of factors. I mean, just the, 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 like you said, meanness, there's so much meanness Mm and it's sad. It breaks my heart. And I, I think that's, that really connects for me, uh, in, in my experience with any sort of lack of self-compassion going through a hard thing, it it is getting progressively easier to internalize that I am, when things are hard, that I am incapable of handling hard Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Not that, it's hard right now and I have to learn new things and figure out how to do them, which is what I say to myself on my best days. But in those quiet times now, it's that that resilience fatigue that, you know, and, and to your point, Sharon and Nikki, to this this like this hyper personalization of badness that mm-hmm. I, you know, I have to fight that self-talk, that language, mm-hmm. that it's that it's not me because my instinct is that I'm incapable of doing mm. these things. And I say that also in, in air quotes, I'm mm. incapable of this right now. Um, and, and that, that's what my lack of self-compassion mm. looks like. Mm-hmm. And that comes from, you know, years of, of, of receiving critical criticism and negative feedback that we all receive throughout our lives. But when you are, have, when you are wired in a different way than, um, than some of your other classmates or when people don't understand ADHD or learning disabilities or twice exceptionality or ASD, um, you, there's a way in which kids don't feel met and because they don't feel met, then they actually, um, start to criticize themselves. Like what is wrong with me that I can't blah, blah, blah. And we carry that into adulthood. So I'd, I'd like to just say a few things about what is self-compassion. So Dr. Kristen Neff, who is you know leading international expert on self-compassion, says that it's composed of kindness, of treating yourself with care and understanding instead of harsh judgment. It's composed of common humanity, understanding that you're part of a larger whole and that not all suffering is the same, but that all humans experience pain and suffering in some way that's worthy of empathy. So you may suffer in a particular way. My neighbor may suffer in a particular way. I may suffer in a particular way. And all of those are different, but the experience of suffering is something that we share despite our socioeconomic, racial, religious, gender orientation differences. So the third component is mindfulness, the ability to be with things as they are and steer clear of avoidance, a denial or minimizing. So self-compassion means asking yourself, what can I do to help you? me? What can I do? Putting your hand on your heart and saying, what can I do to help Mm -hmm. you? Instead of what's going, instead of what's wrong with you that you're feeling X or that you did Y. It's about acknowledging that you're in pain, that you're having a hard time and trying to alleviate it, not ignore it, not turn away from it, but face it and treat it like you would treat a third grader with a skin knee. We say things to ourselves all the time as adults, or te- and even teens do this, um, that you would never say to a third grader with a skin knee. 
you know, and we're, oh my we're, gosh. So, we're so Can mean I just, to ourselves. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. so true. A couple of times this last month, I've had a couple of clients who've been sick, mm-hmm. some with COVID, and um, there's this expectation that they have to continue doing what they were doing before they were sick. And what you just said is such an eye opener, like why you would not tell your third grade student or child or whatever. Oh, you just push through it. Keep, keep, keep going. Right, right, right. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's a, it's, you, you stop fighting with yourself and you start embracing and soothing yourself. Like, it's funny, you know, like when, when we, when you get that, that is a great example, because, you know, if you have a cold, really probably what you want to do is lie on the sofa and watch TV and um, have someone bring you some soup and, you know, rub your feet or put a blanket on you and feel like, Oh, I'm being taken care of a little bit. But instead, Mm -hmm. you know, you get up, you get out the door, you go to work. And a lot of people have to, because of their jobs, they don't have sick time, sick time. If they don't work, they don't get paid. And, and so this just, create this just sort of feeds the, the that stress and empties out that bucket of reserves so that when you get to a, a time when you um when something doesn't work out you don't have anything in your bucket to be able to say okay you know i'm going to pause and and be kind to myself i'm going to take a drink of this lovely you know beautiful spring water here in my bucket and re- refuel my um my tank i can't do that and so mm-hmm. what the, so what we do then is is we we are just hard on ourselves and we we also um in this process particularly people with ADHD or who are you know uniquely wired um feel like they're alone nobody mm-hmm. else is going through this but you're not you're part of a community of people you Nikki and Pete create and foster and hold an incredible community of people and so, you know, I have been wondering, like, like is there even normal anymore? You know, mm-hmm. I've, I've been thinking that we really need to think about our brain types in, in the way we think about gender or race or religion with a diversity umbrella. That's what neurodiverse is. You know, there's a difference mm-hmm. between that and neurodivergent which are, you know, specific brains who are uniquely wired. So we're supposed to get things wrong, air quotes, in life. We're supposed Mm -hmm. to try something, stumble, um, regroup, try it again, um, or pivot. That's part of what learning is, and living is part of learning. And so I think it's really important, not just when we think about compassion, to think about treating ourselves with kindness and being mindful, accepting things as they are, but to remember our common humanity so we can normalize. I'm not the only person who struggles with this. I'm just imagining like the, the, the sort of visual metaphor I'm dealing with right now as I'm listening to you talk is all about my reduced capacity for that resilience that you're talking mm-hmm. about, which makes, do you, do you ever watch Seinfeld? You, were you a Seinfeld fan? Hello. Yes. Forget it. Right. Of course. So there's this episode. You know how old I am. Jer- of course I did. Jer- <laughs> <laughs> Jerry is, is dating this, uh, this woman who uh, is, is really, she has some, some strange sort of capacity for dealing with hard things. And the end of the episode, she gets a phone call that her grandmother has just passed away and she mm-hmm. hangs up the phone and she says, yeah, my grandmother just passed away. And Jerry says, what, aren't you sad? And she says, yeah, I mean, I'm really sad. And then it like immediately drops the hot dog uh, on the floor and starts weeping right? This, this woman starts weeping. And that in the show is the joke. Like this is a person who's miswired for grief, but that's what I feel like right now. Right? Like I can, I like just that, that reduced headroom for hard things means that, you know, I'm out of gas by the time I drop the metaphorical hot dog and I have nothing left to handle because of, again, gestures broadly. And so, you know, your your point about kind of reassessing what the new normal is, is is like that hits me right in the chest because my new normal has never been further from grasp. Like it is it's I reach for what feels normal and it's just like a sprite. It disappears and and I have to go search for it again. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very interesting because when 
you know, when we think about uh, trauma, uh, the, many of the things, when we treat kids with trauma, you know, th there's a huge movement now towards trauma-informed care. And what trauma-informed infor care uh, asks, it, it, it asks a question, which is different than the question we'd asked before. Before the question was, why are you acting this way? What's wrong with you that you're acting this way? And now the question that we ask is, what's happened in your life that's led you to behave like this? What's happened in your life that's led you to having these emotions, to, ha to being worn down? What could you do differently? Um, and I think right now, particularly when we're treating ourselves with more compassion, we want to ask ourselves, hmm, what kind of support would be helpful? And how could I ask for that? What, you know, what would it look like? Um, and to be curious rather than condemning. You know, we condemn mm -hmm. ourselves for the things that are not this or not that. or And these all come from very deep-seated, you know, limiting core beliefs. I'm deficient in some way. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm not enough. I don't, me I don't measure up. I'm not smart. I'm not pretty. I'm not athletic. Whatever it is, you can put that in. But there's a core of deficiency. So I'm curious that when you're, when you're in a place where you're saying those things, how do you, how do you challenge it? I'm so glad you asked that question because I was thinking, oh, we're kind of in this dark corner here now. I got to get us out. <laughs> And yeah. um, so, okay, so I um, think what you want to do is to identify your stinking thinking and what to say back to it. So you are mm. not your thoughts, right? You are the one who is aware of your thoughts and believes them. And that's that mindfulness piece. You know, it's like you are the sky and your thoughts are these clouds. Sometimes they're dark and stormy. Sometimes there's a tornado. And sometimes it's a beautiful day, sun is, is shining and there's no clouds at all. Or they're fluffy. Okay. So you are your thoughts, but you are, you are not your thoughts, but you are aware of them and you're the one who chooses to believe them or not. So you could choose not to believe something and say, oh, wow, you know what? I'm noticing I'm being mean to myself. This takes a lot of work, a mm -hmm. lot of work because you have to notice your behavior, which is an aspect of metacognition that is so hard for so many people, um, particularly with ADHD. So one thing that I think can help is to really focus on the compare and despair behaviors and thoughts. So compare and despair is I'm looking sideways and I'm seeing what other people are doing. Um, and I look at myself, I look over there and I look at myself and I think, oh, that's not as good. Or, and I look over on this side and I think, oh, look at that. And on this is not as good. Mm -mm. We want to look back. We want to look from where we came as individuals and forward mm -hmm. to where we're going. OK, stick with stick your focus on where you've come from and where you want to go rather than what other people are doing. We spend a lot of time in our lives, and this is people with and without age, this is all of us, using our phones as if they're documenting the truth of everybody's lives. And they're not. You know, I don't know about you, but people don't seem to put on Facebook like when they have a really bad pimple or, you know, right. they've had a crappy day. You know, yesterday I had a kind of a crappy day. I didn't post anything. In fact, I don't post a lot, but, you know, that was mm -hmm. a private thing. I don't want people, I wouldn't want people to know, oh, I had a crappy day, except my friend. I told her I had a really crappy day. But, you know, really, I, w I probably should. Like, boy, this day was really crappy. You know, and other people are like, here, yeah. You know, yeah. you can do that. So we really want to identify your stinking thinking and what you can say back to it. And notice when you're engaged in compare and despair and shift your focus from sideways to front and back. That is, I love, I love that because the people on the side of you, they, they don't really have anything to do with your story. Like, this is all about you. It's, it has nothing to do with them. Right. And you have nothing to do, like, they don't have anything to do with you and you don't have anything to do with them. I mean, it, it really right. makes sense that you can just keep 
going forward. But it's interesting. all of all of all of social media is all about sideways. Yeah, it really. A is. lot of yeah. stuff mm-hmm. about popular culture is about sideways. You know, look at what they're doing over here. Look, you know, particularly in in the early days of COVID, like, oh, my God, people are posting these incredible meals they were making and activities and hobbies. And right now I wrote I wrote two books during COVID. I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I'm just trying to like, you know, how could you do that? I'm trying to see clients who are really having a hard time and Mm -hmm. do podcasts and reach people directly. So, you know, everyone uses their time differently. But. We really have to stop that. So that so those are the first two things. So I have a question then. If you're mm-hmm. finding yourself uh, in that negative shame spiral, mm-hmm. then would one of your suggestions be to take a break from social media and <gasps> take yeah. a, take a step away from it for a while? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think right now because we are all fragile, if more fragile than typical because of what we've been living through, living mm-hmm. with and living through, that we want to be really careful about where we direct our attention in terms of social media. Um, it can be very dangerous. You know, people can post pictures of, oh, how happy their grown kids are, or, you know, my child is going to this college, or mm-hmm. my, my, um, you know, my husband got this incredible promotion, and you're going to be in compare and despair. Why isn't that happening to me? Why does that not like instead of, okay, well, good for you. Let's see. Where was I yesterday? Where am I today? And I Mm -hmm. think it's hard to say, or instead of that's, that isn't the same kind of, you know, excitement. Like, oh, yesterday I was in the same place I'm in today. Where was I six months ago? You know, what was Mm -hmm. happening six months ago and where am I now? And that Mm -hmm. how that I think is something that can be helpful because shame spirals are really toxic waste dumps of self-loathing. That's what they are. It's mm-hmm. just, um, they block self-compassion and they block forgiveness because you're blaming and you're criticizing yourself in ways that are, that are, that are, that you probably internalized through your childhood and adolescence, um, that you've heard other people talk to you about, and now you've adopted this voice. And that is the part of you that somehow we have to, you know, we have to move beyond in a way we have Mm to basically put our arm around that part and say, thank you for serving me. I don't really need this anymore. How do you turn this into a practice? I'm thinking if I'm listening to this, I'm I'm thinking, okay, this is obviously not something that I need to, that I I, I need to do just the one time. Uh, I I wish that I could just put my arm around it and say, you know, take a hike. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm moving on. Yeah. Uh, but but this this feels very much like a you know, this is yet another thing that um, that mm-hmm. we can't do just once. Right. We have to right. figure out how to integrate this in the way we think and see and and sort of live and love in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you how do you shake free of that yoke and, and move toward? Well, I think toward this I think the way that you do that is by strengthening mindfulness and mindfulness isn't just about medicate medication. Ha ha. Mindfulness isn't just about meditation or, or yoga or Tai Chi. Those are all ways of practicing mindfulness. You know, what mindfulness does is to help you be aware of where your attention is directed like where is the spotlight of your attention Uh, on if you were wearing a headlamp for example where where are you directing your attention so what we want to be able to do is to think about the parts of yourself that you like and write those down and I put them on my computer Um, and again you can't see because you're listening but I want to tell you that I have like a nice nice rainbow of little post-its on my computer that say things like be the lighthouse, spread the light Mm -hmm. or um, uh, quit taking it personally or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't be anxious and grateful at the same time. So think of something, those are not necessarily things I like about myself because I think that's too embarrassing for me to share with you here. But what I would do is I have these you know, little uh, affirmations, but you think about a couple of things that you like about yourself and write them down in a journal um, and, and think about some things that about yourself that are, um, you don't really like about yourself, but you don't want, you want to get 
you want to turn down the volume on those. So I know you might say, for example, okay, one of the things I like about myself is that I'm friendly. That's hard to do in COVID, right? So it's hard to express that. So I, what I don't like about myself is that I can catastrophize things. So how, you know, how do I, how do I notice that? Because I can get into a negative loop and things can seem oh, like this is going to be bad or that's not going to work out or whatever. And, and, um, and the part of me that's kind of friendly and bubbly and likes to connect with people is actually submerged by the catastrophic thinking because it's negative and it pushes people away. So I want to try to stay in balance. So what I need to do is sort of notice, listen, pay attention to my mood and my words and try when I'm doing that to say, oh, that's a flag. I'm being kind of negative. This is a good opportunity for me to do the flip side, which is to actually reach out to someone and be more of my friendly self to counterbalance and turn that down. So, you know, I, I wish I could say, oh, I want you to do one, two, three, and four, but it's very personal. So um, mm. could, you, could you name the part of you that's kind of critical and mean to yourself? And, you know, maybe find, um, you know, go online and find a funny picture of a cartoon character or something. And then you can learn how to talk back to it when it, when it shows up. That's the first step. Notice when it shows up, notice when you're thinking is that way. And then with compassion saying, you know, thank you very much. I really, I'm not going to listen to you telling me that I'm not smart right now. That's not helpful. I'm in the middle of a meeting. I need to pay attention. That's what, that's what hits me is that I have to figure out like uh, that practice means making the positive that the self-compassionate voice is louder than the negative ones and, and doing it enough every day. It, it kind of reminds me, Pete, of the presentation we did for the conference around joy, like really looking, you know, for your joy. Mm -hmm. You you create it, you look for it, you find it. And so when what you were saying reminded me of that, like, OK, here you are having all of these negative things going through your head. What would bring you joy right now? And it could be just like playing with your dog, but it also puts you in the, the present where for me anyway, you kind of see like, okay, maybe that other thing really isn't as big mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm experiencing this moment right now that brings me joy. And, and there's some peace in that. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. So it, it's really about uh, identifying this, you know, this negativity, having a name for it, like, um, uh, you know, I don't know, negative Nancy, Nancy. or something. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I mean, my friend and I this year, we've decided it's 2022. We have a, a peppermint patty club. And I don't know if you mm. remember peppermint patty from um, Charlie Brown, but she was like, pretty positive. Mm. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we are, we're, we call each other up. So I have, I have my accountability body buddy and I we call her up I'm like hey I need a pepper and patty minute because I feel like I'm negative Nancy right now and so that can help you um I think being able to write down some things that you like about yourself so that um when you are feeling bad you can turn to that list and be like okay I know that the, the negative voice like here's what the negative voice tells me here's what the positive voice tells me so you have some comparison you have something to go to and put it on your phone like let's not be embarrassed about it. it's your phone who cares right no one's going to mm -hmm. see that except mm -hmm. for you we want to turn down the noise of that negativity and I'm sorry for anyone whose name is Nancy out there. I'm not trying to offend you. I, um, I was just thinking the same thing. I'm glad you said something. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, but we want to, um, we really want to be able to start to turn down the noise on that and turn up the, the volume on, I'm a whole person. There are mm -hmm. parts of myself that, are not my favorite parts. There are parts of myself that I really love. I'm learning to be okay with the whole package and I'm good enough as I am. 
And that is practicing self-compassion. So you um, identify your, your, your stinking thinking, which there you go. There's no Nancy in that term. And, um, <laughs> and what you're going to say back to it. You identify your own peppermint patty statements, you know, things about yourself that you like. And um, you have some phrases in your toolkit that you can say to that negativity, that negative voice when it emerges. Things that com- can combat statements like you're alone. Um, you know, nobody likes you. Uh, you're stupid. You're not attracted. You need something to say back to that. And you you don't expect yourself to do that in the moment. Have it like have it written down somewhere. Have it on your phone. Maybe create a playlist of songs that counteract that voice. You know, happy tunes or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I love that. All of that I think is very helpful in a stressful moment. Though, are you going to be able to do all that? You know, you're at work. You're feeling crappy. Probably not. In those moments, what you want to do is actually have some kind of healing practice. And that practice might be, you know, closing your eyes and breathing in a color that you find very soothing and breathing out, um, you know, like gray or black or whatever the tension is and doing that several times. You can do it with alternate nostril breathing. You can do it with you know, box breathing or smell a rose, blow out the candle. Um, That is what you need to do in a moment. You may not be able to do all these other little steps are too complicated. So in the thick of a moment, or imagine you're to do, to try to breathe in a soothing color and breathe out like a smoky kind of thing Mm -hmm. that you're letting go of something or picture yourself at a beautiful place outdoors where you're happy, you know, go to the bathroom if you need to do this and take a couple minutes and just do an exercise where you see yourself happy, where you see or you breathe in a color so that you can say to yourself, um, I am not this feeling. This is a feeling. It's a terrible feeling. I don't like it. I feel alone, but I'm more than this feeling. There's more to me than that. That's putting you know, your hand on your heart and being kind to yourself. Yeah. And it loops back into what you were saying at the very beginning of don't, you know, try not to deny these things. Like you want to, you don't want to avoid them. You want to, uh, lack of a better word, embrace them, even though they're hard, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because it feels like that's helping you move through it. Not not that you're denying it but you're you're working through it is probably you know what right you want to you want to face it and acknowledge it because the more that you try to push it aside and push it down yeah it gets stronger it gets more powerful sidebar i was going to save this question for uh after our conversation but we do have a question in the chat room and i think it'd be good for everybody would you please tell us what is alternate nostril breathing Yes, I would. It's a yoga thing. So everybody, if you're listening, take your index finger and close your right nostril and breathe in with your left. And breathe out through your left. And now switch. Close your left nostril and breathe in with your right. And you do it several times. And what does that do for us? I have no idea, but it calms your nervous system. (laughs) I love it. Well, I think it would. I mean, just from my own experience in this, you know, two seconds that I did it, it makes you really focus on the breathing. Like, you can't think of anything else. That's right. You're focused on the breathing and you're breathing deeply because you don't get Mm -hmm. as much air when you close a nostril. Right. So Mm -hmm. you have to breathe more deeply. And actually, I find that kids with ADHD really like this. It's like, oh, Dr. Sharon, I have this in my nose. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, cool. Get it out there. Yeah. Let's do. Have a big nose blow, you know. Um, So that's that's a very I think that's a very helpful technique. Harder to do when you're in public because your fingers at your nose. Sometimes I encourage you to put your hand right on your chest. 
Um, some mm-hmm. people do belly breathing, but again, that mm-hmm. that can, people don't always feel like feel having their belly. Sometimes people push their belly with their diaphragm muscle. It's not it's not relaxing. But if you put your hand on your chest, like you're you know you're pledging to allegiance or you're you're you're, you're love, sending a not life nice knocking uh, on the door of your heart, you can breathe in and feel your whole chest expand and breathe out. You breathe into the hand on your chest. Uh, one of the things that I like to do too, when you're doing that is I like, I think it's the tiger breath where you mm. just like, when you exhale, you're just like, <laughs> there's yeah. this like relief of like, yeah. and, and I imagine like any kind of stress or tension is that black smoke that you're just like, you know, blowing exactly. out as hard as you can outside of your body. It's that's yeah, such a, I, love I love that idea. Sometimes you can, even if you're by yourself, you could breathe in really deeply and then let out a noise like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, at the end, like, you'll feel like, oh, whoa, look at that. I'm like, you yeah. know, I, I feel Feeling a little much bit of better. space. I feel some space. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the whole thing I would like people to walk away from is not that there's the right way to be self-compassionate or a wrong way, that it's your way. And that there are tools that are, are where you ask yourself, how can I help you? How can I help me? What am I feeling? You're acknowledging what's going on and you're trying to alleviate it by embracing and soothing yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And so whatever, that's why it's important to have some phrases. Like for me, I say, I'm doing the best I can with the resources I have available right now. Mm-hmm. And sometimes mm-hmm. that means right. I'm not going to do a great job because I don't have a lot of resources, right? But I'm doing well, the best I can right now. That you can. And and one of the things I always say is my, you know, what's my intention? And my intentions mm-hmm. are always good. They're mm-hmm. always good. Mm-hmm. And that helps me, you know, get through certain situations where if I'm, you know, I don't know, but that's just something that I think about definitely to, that helps me get through. Or I'm more than my mistakes, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. we are and or it's natural to make a mistake or so everybody stumbles at some point. So what right. to have right. a couple of those phrases that you can pull out of your back pocket in those moments when you're, you know, wrapped up in compare and despair or a shame spiral or you lost it with your, your kids and you're like, I'm a terrible mother. What you want to say is, you know what? Everybody makes mistakes sometimes. Everybody's something. Yeah. That's not a pass for abusive behavior in any way. Um, uh, and that's not what we're talking about today. I'm talking about the normal kind of typical everyday stumbles of I lost my temper. Mm-hmm. I missed the deadline on something. I um, I went out to get milk to the grocery store and I got everything except milk. You know, <laughs> any yeah. of those kinds of things. Well, yeah, I, I yeah. this is, is so valuable. And I think I, I think part of it is, again, back to that, you know, for me, I, I have to think of it as a practice, but also that it is not I'm not avoiding anything. Right. I And I don't even think I uh, for me, I just need to make the right choices about how I find that inspiration again, whether it's uh, alternate nostril breathing or uh, a mindfulness, just sort of meditation moment of silence, or if it is, you know, like I'm not on social media all all that much, but I do love my bespoke communities, right? Mm-hmm. I love the ADHD community. I love sometimes mm-hmm. when I'm just, you know, in a, a crazy fit, I'll come over and just scroll through some of our, our community because it, it, it does calm me to see, you know, other mm-hmm. people actively engaged. And, and um, so I think just, just being choosy uh, about mm-hmm. what it is that, that fuels yeah. me is, is I think really important to, to be able to make the positive messages louder than the mm-hmm. negative ones. And to be able Sharon. to say to yourself, you know, um, and this is, these are some of, these are very, very, very common, but may I be safe? May I be happy? May I accept my limitations with grace? May I live with ease? And to wish that for other people. You know, may you be safe. May you be happy. May you live with ease. 
Um, some of the more traditional Buddhist teachings are may you be free from suffering. So we, we really want to have some things to wish for ourselves, you know, yeah. as, in this process of self-compassion. And, and I do want to say one thing about forgiveness, because the self-compassion and self-forgiveness go together. Um, and that's, I think, why uh, Dr. Neff talks about the idea of common humanity. We all, every one of us, have to practice some forgiveness in aspects of our lives, whether toward us, toward ourselves, I mean, toward our partners, towards our children, towards our parents, our friends, our colleagues. We have to understand this idea that we are all one common humanity. We suffer, we stumble, we eat, we sleep, we go to the bathroom, we experience joy and fear and anger. This is part of, the, of, of being human. And I think for a lot of people with ADHD or people who are on the spectrum or people who are wired differently, there's a feeling I'm not part of the common humanity, I'm different. And it's important to say, yes, in some ways you are unique, but every, you know, everyone has their own particular idiosyncrasies. Um, and, and that's important to value instead of just saying, I'm this and it's not okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Beautiful. Great way Sharon, to end. Thank you. Yes. So thank much, you so much. Uh, for all that you do. What do you, do you have anything you're working on that you want to plug for us? Well, um, tonight I'm doing a webinar for Ada on, um, uh, being um, confident and courageous, uh, basically, so uh, on social anxiety. And uh, let's see, do I have anything else coming? I know I should say yes. Um, next week <laughs> on Wednesday, and you can check this out through my website, I'm doing a webinar on um, anxiety in elementary school age children and what it's like to parent them. So if you go to my website, that would be a great place to check that out and sign up. And um, in general, I would encourage you to please go to my website and sign up. I have a weekly blog. I only send out one a week. Um, I don't like to bother people. Uh, you can connect with me through Facebook uh, as well as LinkedIn and Twitter. And every Friday, and that includes this Friday, I do a live um, event for Attitude Magazine, attitudemag.com. And this is an incredible community of people all over the world who live with ADHD and ADHD friends, um, like anxiety or depression or learning disabilities or autism or oppositionality. So it's a great way to kind of come together and hear from other people and there's a topic and we discuss it and I try to answer your questions. So please join me for any and all of those things. Fantastic. Wow. All of the links great. in the show notes, please click on them with abandon. Thank you, uh, everybody, for hanging out with us, uh, for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and your attention. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer and Dr. Sharon Celine, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you right here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Thank you.